Hi there, and welcome to this uh, special episode of the Ski Podcast. Uh, this is an interview with author Mark Frary, uh, the author of Aiming High, The Life of Ski and Travel Pioneer Erna Lowe. Uh, regular listeners will know that we interviewed Mark uh, in episode 51 of the Ski Podcast, and Jim and myself reviewed the book in uh, episode 52 as part of our Ski Book group. But here I talk to Mark in a lot more detail about uh, Erna Lowe, the, uh, the founder of uh, the uh, company Erna Lowe Travel, uh, about the history of the ski industry, uh, how people used to go ski touring before there were even lifts uh, around, uh, and the impact of the Second World War and how that helped Erna Lowe build her business. We also look at who invented the chalet holiday, whether indeed it was her, uh, her rival, Austrian rival, uh, Walter Ringham, and also what the link is between Erna Lowe and Only Fools and Horses. So uh, sit back and uh, have a listen to this in-depth interview with Mark Frary, author of uh, Aiming High, The Life of Ski and Travel Pioneer, Erna Lowe. Great, so um, I'm here with Mark Frary uh, today. Um, hi Mark, you right? Hi Ian, I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, you will know uh, that uh, Jim and I picked uh, Aiming High, the life of ski and travel pioneer Erna Lowe for our ski book group and uh, delighted to be able to introduce you as the author of, uh, of that book. I can't remember, when did it come out, Mark? Uh, so it came out in 2012 um, and it, it really was time to coincide with the um, 80th anniversary uh, I suppose you could call it a Vernalo. It wasn't sort of the anniversary of the company um, of that name, but it was the 80th anniversary of the first time that she actually put an advert in the paper to try and encourage people uh, to go on ski trips with her. Yeah, that very uh, famous uh, advert. I know it's in here somewhere, <laughs> but it's a, the Viennese graduate is looking for people to join her on a trip to Austria, something yeah, like for, that. Right? Yeah, fifteen pounds for a fortnight, including rail and hotel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it excellent. Had to, and there had to be young people who, who would go as well. Okay, and, and so so that's Ern Lowe, and I'm definitely very keen to ask you a lot more about her. I I, I wondered though how. It came about. It's obviously the 80th anniversary. How did, how we, uh, you know, how were you asked to do the book, or did you, you know, choose to? You just thought it would be a good subject. Well, um, how it happened is that around uh, that sort of time, I started. Um, I'd been writing about skiing and, and travel for various newspapers and things like the Times, and I think um, at that point, I sort of realised that something was happening in the world. Maybe it was a bit late to it but uh, the internet was changing absolutely everything mm -hmm. and uh, so I think you know I was sitting sitting there thinking you know what what do I need to do to make sure I survive this this period because the whole world of newspaper journalism was, was changing rapidly I think and um, so I've been talking to my boss at the Times uh, Steve Keenan who is the um, online travel editor there at the time and we, we came up with this idea of um, starting a social media company for for travel so you know tying our experience to what we thought was going to be the next big thing um, with the internet and so you know, things like blogging social media all that sort of thing yeah and um, as part of that um, we thought you know w one way we could use our experience was to uh, work with travel companies to um, help celebrate their their big anniversaries um, for example so you know we both knew lots of companies and um, you know that were coming up to some big birthdays for a couple of right that makes that stuff. makes sense and you you obviously mentioned earlier that yeah. this was the book came out for the 80th anniversary yeah. of Ernalo. so did you approach Ernalo? yeah then? so this, how, this is how it started so um, we I, I knew um joanna yellow lee's bound who was um the um, chief executive managing director of uh, Ernalo at the time um, and we said, you know, we, we know you're celebrating this 80th anniversary and would you like to do something surrounding that? Maybe we could do something that combines you know, social media and more traditional methods. And um, that time, Joanna said, well, actually, I've, ha I've had this idea for a long time that um, maybe um, somebody could write a book about the life of Ernello. And um, I'd actually written a number of books before, sort of using my uh, scientific background uh, in, uh, to write books about popular science and, um, and, and a few other things as well. And I thought, well, actually, okay. you know, so I, a bit of a, a bit of a leap, a bit of a change of direction for this one, then. Uh, yeah, but um, obviously, I'd written extensively 
about the ski industry. Um, I, knew, I knew Joanna pretty well, and um, I thought actually, you know, there's probably going to be a really interesting story there. But um, what I didn't know was quite how interesting would it actually be. So, <laughs> so we um, yeah. we sort of came to an agreement that um, we, we'd look into it. And at this point, um, um, so Joanna and Anilo were in a sort of a small sort of pokey office in in Reese Mews in South Kensington, and she showed me into this room. And she said, "Well, well, this is it. This is the archive, and, um, and, and it was uh, all of the stuff that um, you know related to Erna Lowe's life, her early life, and you know, lots of personal memorabilia in there. But um, you know, I looked at it and thought, what have I let myself in for? Because you know, in that there was a whole room of of kind of archive material yeah. to to work your way through. It was, but um, you know, unfortunately, like um, like a library, it wasn't in any." order whatsoever so hmm. you, you had yeah. things from the you know the 1980s sitting on stuff from from the 1920s and well, um, funnily yeah. enough you kind of when you read the book you get the impression that possibly Erna, Erna herself Erna Lowe you know could have been a, a bit uh, uh, like that and certainly from reading the book you can you can get a feeling for for the material you had I mean obviously you had access to a lot of personal letters and she was one of those sort of people who who made a copy of all of her letters. That's so right. She had yeah, so, copies of her correspondence. Yeah, so, you know, you'd, you'd be going through and you'd find a pile of um, brochures, for example, from the 1960s, which are, which are fascinating reading as well. You know, she was a, an inveterate hoarder of things, so you'd, you'd go through these, and they, they proved, you know, incredible material for, for the book, you know, so, you know, even though reading brochures perhaps isn't so, so much fun, but, um, you know, for a, a bit of a nerd like I am, it was it was great. But then, you know, stuck between the pages of these brochures, you'd come across these personal letters of hers that um, she'd written, you know, to, to her family friends, and uh, there was one to the, the Queen, and, uh, you know, so all these things, and, and that really helped sort of get a feel for who she was as a person as well as being yeah. a, as a businesswoman and um, you realize you know she was absolutely incredible and you know I, I knew of the reputation of, of Erna you know that I, had I, you I, ever I, met her at all? I hadn't actually I, I, um, I sort of entered the industry about a year or so after she retired yeah, and, um, <clears throat> so yeah, very, I, very similar for me. Actually, I, I'd worked in the industry for quite a long time, but yeah, I, having read the book, I now realise that she'd gone off to watch Wimbledon around the time that I started to work uh, back in the UK. Yeah, yeah, and she sort of suddenly realised actually she didn't, uh, you know, she wanted to sort of pull away from it, and and by this time she. She did, um, got her succession plan in place because, um, you know, she didn't have any children, um, never married, yeah. and so didn't have a natural, you know, family successor to her. But, um, you know, she'd taken Joanna, who I mentioned earlier, on um, in the 80s but, uh, to help out uh, with, with the company. But um, she realised, actually, Joanna was, was very similar to her in lots of ways and that she would actually prove to be a, a very good successor. Um, in that, yeah. so uh, just uh, on you know on the sort of reputation, I just wanted to talk about that. You know, uh, obviously coming into industry at that time, I, there were lots of journalists who'd been in the industry for a long time, and you know there were all these stories about you know how formidable um, Erna was. You know, she was a she was a big woman, very very imposing physically, and um, you know wouldn't uh, take, sort of suffer fools gladly. And so mm -hmm. so I had that, and then you know then actually going into the into the archive material and reading these letters, you just, you know, it really sort of starts to sort of peel away those layers. And actually, you know, she's, you know, it was a vulnerable person, but, you know, very strong. She did things like, you know, driving around Europe in a car with, with her assistant, uh, Valerie Shafto, um, in this old car that they used to call Slippery Sam. And the idea was to find places mm -hmm. to send, um, people on holiday and so she was one of the first people ever to sort of identify these little um, sleepy Spanish fishing villages um, that would subsequently go on to become you know the places that boomed in the package holiday revolution in the 1960s and she was doing yeah the, the two of them would go around um, in this car and you just think you know who would do that I mean you know you have to be very confident in yourself to be, to be able to do that at a time for sure I mean what comes across definitely in the book is uh we say like she was formidable but she clearly had a lot of business acumen as well and was very good at like spotting a gap in the market yeah. and uh 
using well she seemed to be i got the impression she was a very good negotiator as well very good at kind of putting things together and yeah so so on the skiing side of things you know she had a very very close links with austria having been born in vienna um but um she made a point of you know actually dealing directly with these um family owners of hotels in all these ski resorts and um she would go there in person and you know developed um, multi-year relationships with them and if anything was going wrong she'd be the one who would drive out there in her car and uh, and actually um, negotiate these deals so I think um, you, know, you know these days you, you wouldn't necessarily have that so much but um, no, you know, it's, it's it was cool. very very personal and so you know that sometimes yeah. you'd find a letter from from some hotel owner you know some aging hotel owner you know saying I remember when you first came and how you know how scared I was of your um, negotiated <laughs> tactics, but it was done. In, you know, it was expressed yeah. very warmly, and uh, I think she <clears throat> drove a hard bargain. And uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. She she did um, <clears throat> put that at the at the heart of everything she did, and and was really innovative. You know, in this you know, yeah. a time when you know very few people were doing um, ski holidays. So yeah. you know, the Lunds obviously were were doing theirs, and. Uh, <clears throat> um, Walter Ingham as well, but um, yeah. you know that she was one of very few to do that. So she was really was one of the you know, early pioneers of that. But yeah. also, the, as I say, the package holiday business, the summer pack a hol package holiday business, and also she was one of the first people to identify a market for big house parties. In the in this section of the interview, I ask Mark about the history of the ski industry. Uh, how Erna Lowe was taking guests to ski resorts before there were even lifts, when they had to walk with their skis to the top. And also uh, about a time when hardly anyone went to France and almost everyone went to Austria and Switzerland. You know, I, I really enjoy this book way more than I was expecting to. I don't really know what I was expecting, but um, what I didn't realise was it was going to be such a kind of deep dive into the uh, the history of the of the ski industry because she was uh, such a pioneer. I mean, you mentioned in our other interview, I think it was 1932, she placed her first ad, um, you know, offering um, or looking for people to go on a, on a ski holiday. But, um, you know, those early days, the, the picture you paint of those early days of her holidays are amazing. They're so far removed from what you see on the slopes or, or for a holiday today. That's right. I mean, you know, you, it's, it's almost difficult to think about what it must have been like to go on a ski holiday. I know, you know, you go on a ski holiday today and it can be quite challenging, particularly if you have a family with you, you know, like lugging all the equipment around and, you know, getting from place to place. But if you think back to then, you know, it, it was so much more difficult then. And if you wanted to go skiing, you really had to want to go skiing. So, you know, th those days, um, you know, you had to go by, by train usually because, um, you know, we didn't have um, mass air transport as we do today and and then when you actually got to, to the resorts themselves I mean there were generally no lifts at all so one, actually one of the that, things I that found really out, that yeah. really struck me I mean that, uh, <laughs> like you say I had to go by train you got to ship in you know I love traveling by train that's great but effectively they were all ski touring holidays weren't they I mean yeah. they had to walk up the mountain yeah or, or take a mule with their with their gear up with them and you know sometimes they'd be you know going up in, in a pair of skins um you know for hours just to get one run down because they couldn't um, get up any other way and you know I was, I was going to say as well I mean this is what I found interesting about you know the research in the project is about you know finding out a lot of how the ski industry came about and one of the things that I was really fascinated by was um, you know how after the second world war you know in places like Austria there was the uh, the Marshall Plan you know which was the US funded um, program to rebuild Europe and uh, many Austrian villages um used money from that marshall plan to install yeah. ski lifts yeah you know, which is incredible that. That really interesting it's yeah. incredible and and also you know following that you know the french soldiers who'd been out there in in germany and austria um who then went back home after the end of the war they said actually that, that was a really good idea with with the ski lifts we'll do that and so that's that really is what helps um give birth to the french yeah, I, as well. I, I i found i actually folded that page over page 96 talking <laughs> about you know cable cars that were you know were built with money from the european recovery program so um yeah fascinating to see how they uh, uh had an impact 
And, and you know, we were talking about how things are so different. I mean, you just, a concept is completely different like that. I love the fact that, um, you know, there'd be a price for the holiday, but there are lots of extras. Like if you wanted to have a, every time you wanted to have a bath, you had to pay yes. extra money. <laughs> I think, you know, a lot of this as well, you have to realize that, um, you know, there were currency restrictions on various things, um, uh, you know, at various points after the war. So so they had to sort of be very con- um, constructive with um, ways to sort of get around the, the regulations. So, you know, that you would have all of these supplements like we do today when you fly on Ryanair or whatever. But, um, you know, you could only spend a certain amount on your holiday itself. But the, the extras, if you could find the money, then, you know, you could pay those extras when you got there. So it wouldn't seem as though you're breaking your uh, your allowed amount for the year. Right, because there was another bit I'm trying to see where I found it, but you had to pay for cakes and things like that <laughs> as well. But definitely definitely for baths. And there was some, I can't remember where it was now, some letter from someone complaining about uh, uh, the fact that they had to pay for their bars. They thought it was out yes. of order. <laughs> I think, you know, the world has gone full circle, hasn't it? You know, so uh, <laughs> well, sort of for things sure. are creeping yeah, back in exactly. again. And yeah. and interesting as well that you said, um, you know, when, when Ernelo was first doing holidays, you know, Austria was the number one uh, country. And uh, in the book, at one point, it says that in 1970, there were only two uh, companies that featured or offered French ski resorts. That's incredible uh, we, now when you think about yes, it, isn't it? You know, exactly. where, where, you know Austria w- was dominant in the way that France is today. You know, everyone goes to Three Valleys. And, um, yeah. you know, but Erna Lowe herself was, was quite instrumental in bringing those French resorts to the British public. Yeah, so um, she, you know, went... In the 60s, she was um, really there sort of thinking, you know, how can I bring these new resorts on places like like Flen, for example, which her company is very sort of closely associated with and, and La Plan, you know, these purpose built resorts that sprung up around that time. And she recognized that, you know, that they would be a, a, a product that British skiers would, would really like and uh, made it a lot easier for, for people going on holidays, you know, because of that sort of ski in, ski out. Thing. And so she developed the, some of those early relationships, becoming uh, representatives for those resorts in the, in the UK market and um, really sort of got us into the habit of, of going to France. I mean, uh, others did as well, but um, she was right there and recognized what an opportunity that was. And, um, you know, obviously that was to the detriment of her, her native Austria. But, um, you know, she really did introduce uh, Britons to French skiing. Uh, In this section, Mark tells us about the surprising link between the TV programme Only Fools and Horses and uh, Ern Lowe. Also about his time at the British Library when he was researching a uh, a tragedy in the uh, early years of the Ern Lowe Ski Company. And finally, uh, a little bit about Erna's um, generosity to her friends. Now, you mentioned to me before that when you first went in uh, and Joanna... Joanna from Ernelo showed you your uh, um, resources. It was basically a whole room full of different papers and clippings and brochures and things like that. I mean, I wondered how they weren't in any order, were they? So you had to kind of, how long did it take you to kind of go through that mountain of information? Um, it was um, probably about a year from start to finish. And, um, you know, and I had to go through it more than once as well. So I, I literally picked the first box up and looked at it and went through it. And um, as I mentioned previously, you know, everything was sort of mixed in with everything else. So there'd be a brochure and then a, then a love letter. And then, uh, you know, um, there was even a, like a, a box brownie camera sort of sitting in one of these boxes and a, um, right. and a, a label from one of her charter trains going to the Alps. And, you know, so you literally you would go through and you, um, and this was actually one of the hardest parts of the research was sort of, you know, you really did have to be concentrating all the time because you would sometimes go through and find something that was actually really, really interesting as far as the story was going. But it would be, you know, sandwiched between two bits of of other things. So, you know, one of the things, for example, was um, I I found this um, letter with a reference to something that had happened in in the Alberg um, Uh, in 1952. And, um, and, And I thought... It's odd that I don't seem to have any details of anything about this. And it was referring to some incident. And um, I ended up going to the uh, British Library 
um, <clears throat> newspaper archives, um, in which were in Collendale in North London at that time. And um, I think it probably comes as a shock to to the youths of today that not everything is on the internet, and you'd go there, and uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's an incredible um, trove of. Of information, and I literally went through all of these drawers of microfilm, and um, you know, finding stuff out. You, you know, you don't have an index or anything like that. And I, but eventually, um, I found out what this reference was to, and it was basically um, uh, an unfortunate accident. You know, a natural accident that had happened in the art book in, in 1952 to a, um, a busload of and all those um, guests and um unfortunately they'd they'd been caught um, in an avalanche this was before the you know the the old tunnel had had opened up so you know you really did have to go around all the sort of uh, windy roads and across the mountain bridges and everything through the mountain passes and um um and this um the incident was that there was an avalanche and the bus bus got um pushed over over a bridge and um you know many of the people actually died um on on that you know which is you know an incredibly sad um occasion but um you know as i say i hadn't i hadn't got any information about this and you know erna didn't reference in it in any of her her notes and uh, you know it comes as a total surprise to Joanna, the um, managing director of the company, that, that this had happened because, you know, if something like that had happened today, you know, the reputation of the company would For be, sure. would it be would really tarnished. It would be tarnished. such a significant uh, uh, um, event in the history of the company. Yeah. And <clears throat> obviously you decided, you know, you, you just came across it, but it was so significant that you use that incident as the prologue at the start of the book. Right? Yeah, I think um, what, what I was I was really sort of torn about what to do about it because obviously, you know, you don't, don't want to sort of you know sensationalize these things but um you know it, it seemed to really um highlight you know Erna's uh, pragmatism and um you know obviously it was a, an incredibly sad event you know, people lost their lives but um you know and it could have meant the end of her company at a time you know it was just coming out of the second world war and uh, you know her resourcefulness meant that you know she still the company still retained its reputation for um, for looking after guests and um but um you know she she was pragmatic about it and um you know and kept in touch with with the people who'd been affected by it and um and then carried on to you know to even greater heights uh, for the company in in the decade that followed so so that's you know so such a major incident one of the things you dug out from all of the uh, you know that treasure trove of information that you had in there but the other thing that comes across from uh, the book, you know, very clearly is you clearly interviewed what seems to be a very large number of people who, you know, interacted with Erna, worked for uh, Erna Lowe uh, in her life. And do you know how many, how many people you interviewed? And oh, countless. I mean, I think, I think this really comes from um, my background as a, as a scientist. You know, I, I like being prepared and fully researched about these things and um so you know it felt that if if these people were still around and had reminiscences of erna because i hadn't actually met her that i really should try and find out what she was like as a person from those people who had, who knew her were friends or or had worked with her and um you know, and I think it was invaluable, in fact. And, um, you know, what came as a, one of the greatest surprises and one of my fondest memories of the whole process was uh, discovering that Roger Lloyd Pack, who we know as best as Trigger, the, um, who's the actor from Only Fools and Horses, um, yeah. it turns out that his mum had worked with um, Erna for, for many, many years. And, um, <clears throat> and actually, Roger ha had too and had spent many of his... Sort of formative years hanging around the office in in South Kensington doing things for the company. Yeah. So things his, like his uh, quotes were very <laughs> very good. He wasn't a, he wasn't he was quite happy to be quite direct about the sort of person I think uh, you know that he, she was. Yeah, I think so, and it, and it gave it really did give an insight. I mean, he, you know, he was clearly incredibly fond of Erna, and he recognised that you know she was you know some people found her to be formidable and maybe unapproachable, but you know there was a there was a definite uh love of her there you know in, in the way that you know perhaps as a sort of a, a favored aunt or something and um you, you know so so there was a warmth there and I, and I was really glad that I had the opportunity to to interview him and sa sadly obviously he died um shortly after the, the book appeared and, and in fact a couple of the others who I interviewed 
did also. So it felt that, um, you know, we'd just done this in time. And I know, you know, an 80th anniversary, as the book was intended to recognize, you know, it, you are always going to run into this. But um, I was so glad that I'd done that. And it, it, it enabled me to put across uh, that that side of the story the sort of personal um element for sure and i think that also comes across as well that clearly you know she was a very direct uh, like task focused kind of person yet you realize from the interviews that she was um for people who she you know cared for very considerate and there's all sorts of um uh, mentions of you know small uh, well even large uh, gifts for different people in different circumstances that were unprompted, etc. Yeah, sort of, you know, help helping out buying people's houses, that sort of thing. I, I mean, she was, yeah. you know, she was she was not fabulously wealthy by any means, but um, she was comfortable, had a nice house in in South Kensington, and um, um, you know, for, for people who were trusted and in her inner circle, then she would really do anything to do that uh, to to help them. And um, and that comes across. And um, you know, Roger uh, there, and he, he shared a lot of uh, the details of that. And um, you know, in the in the time after the publication of the book, we actually had um, a launch event um, in Notting Hill at the Coronet Cinema, and he actually agreed to come and speak and uh, spoke um, after the event. And you know, he he actually sh- shared some of these stories of that, and I think people found that. You know, incredible that here was this uh, well-known actor and you know just revealing his soul um and and i think you know the other story about that uh, that fil- film event or the book launch event is that um you know one of the things that we found um while sort of trawling through this huge room of, of stuff was um some old um eight millimeter eight millimeter uh, film cine film that erna yeah. had shot herself sort of back in the in the 30s and 40s and so um, we actually managed to get that um, digitized and cleaned up uh, with help from the British Film Institute and uh, we created a, a short film which you can still see on, on YouTube actually just sort of documenting some of those those early trips and I, I just find it fascinating to look on that you know and see this young woman sort of smiling out and uh, skiing on all this old equipment <laughs> it's a very different yeah, world I'll, very sort of care, uh, I've seen carefree those, uh, as well <laughs> Yeah, and I will drop um, uh, drop some of the links uh, uh, in there because there's more than just one though. There's a bunch of different clips. Mm, that's right. Yeah, we had I think we we had about fifty or sixty reels of film. Some of it had uh, <laughs> deteriorated and falling apart, but others, right. <clears throat> you know, there, there were there were lots of different things that you do. Great. Excellent. Well, that's brilliant, uh, Mark. Thanks very much for, again for giving us a great uh, insight and well done for doing all those interviews. And actually, I think, you know, just well done for creating this, um, this, this record. It, you know, it's a really valuable insight into the person, but also uh, like a, a record of the history of the ski industry. You know, it fits in really well with some of the other books that are out there. So, um, yeah, thanks very much. Well, thanks for your comments. I mean, I I, I hope it comes across. I I really um, enjoyed uh, writing the book. I mean, much more than I perhaps thought I would. I mean, I knew it was going to be interesting, but not as interesting as it turned out to be. And hopefully some of that enthusiasm comes across in the pages of the book. And it's been great to speak to you about it today. In the final part of our uh, interview... Mark tells us his views on uh, the debate over who invented the chalet holiday. Was it Erna Lowe herself? Was it uh, perhaps Walter Ingham's? Or was it even a man called Colin Murchison? And we also uh, look at how Erna Lowe took advantage of that uh, pent-up demand that existed uh, after the Second World War from young people who hadn't been able to travel. Um, a parallel perhaps with uh, our current Uh, environment where people aren't able to travel and perhaps a a positive sign for the ski industry in the future. Now one question that crops up in the book which I found kind of interesting is uh, did Erna Lowe um, create the chalet holiday? Uh, You know I've I've read what it says in the book I'm interested to know Mark what you think uh, about that. It is an interesting one because I I think it's like um, a lot of inventions you know lots of people claim the credit for it you know you look at you know everyone sort of um you know imagines that they know who invented the television for example 
and uh, yet when you when you look into it actually there were several people who were working on similar things all at the same time and it's just the one that's become best known is is John Leakey Baird uh, for example but um, you know it's the same I think um, with with chalet holidays and I think you know the elements were there um, you know people were doing similar sorts of things around that same time and I think you know she she has a claim to be one of the in, inventors of the chalet holiday I mean there, there are others I think as well but um, if you look at you know the, the elements that go into a, a chalet holiday um, I think you know she was was really an innovator and do, does have a claim to being um, that person who did invent it. So you look at the because there's her this chap called Colin Colin Murchison. Is that yeah. his name? Yeah. So um, you know, so he he claims to have invented it as well, and I'm sure um, others do too. You know, you know some of those sort of pioneers from from other companies um, around then as well. You know, people like you know Inghams and 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 that. But um, I think that, you know you have to look at some of the evidence. I uh, spoke in one of these interviews about um, Erna um, setting up house parties in the UK, yes. for example, you know, in the 1930s and 1940s. And um, I think, you know, that, that sort of idea of getting together groups of like-minded people who didn't necessarily know each other, but into a single place and, you know, catering for them and you know, their their particular interests. So, in the case of the house parties, it was, you know, maybe playing backgammon and chess and things like that. Um, and you know, those those house parties were um, unashamedly focused on the sort of middle classes. You know, people from uh, who worked for the BBC, where where Erna herself had actually worked for some time as well. And you know, so she translated that concept into. Um, into the Alps, I think, and you know, and so what we know is a, is a chalet holiday um, could well have have come from that, and she was certainly working on those in the nineteen thirties. Yeah, and, and well, 1940s. I guess it is. It is like you say. It's all sort of maybe a matter of uh, of definition, and other people are doing things at the same time. But um, you know, certainly she was she she. Um, transported uh, the idea of that uh, you know british um holiday we we book a house and bring a whole group of people together who don't necessarily know each other and establish that in in ski resorts which sounds remarkably similar <laughs> to uh, to what happens in a chalet now although i did see that um, in some cases they turned up and they had to do the cooking themselves <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. I think um, I, I mean that was certainly came over from the house party uh, thing, and um, but uh, yeah, I think I think you know Colin Murchison Small, uh, Murison Small. Sorry, um, I mean he he really does have a claim uh, to being the, the sort of father father of it all, and um, you know he he sort of came up with the idea of sort of having um, chalet girls and things like that. So. Right. Um, did you he know, work so, for Ernalo at, at, at all? Was he was he one of her reps or something? He um, he worked with her for for a little while and uh, then went off um, to do his own thing. And yeah. um, you know, so you know, he was clearly sort of influenced by what um, Erna was doing. But um, you know, like like any great inventor, you know, you can say you're standing on the sh shoulders of giants. <laughs> Yeah. And at the same time, one thing I didn't realise either until I read the book is that uh, Ingham's is named after a chap called Walter Ingham, who was also Austrian. Yeah, he was another one of these, um, you know, so, um, you know, the background for the book, as I was researching it, and I came across, you know, a lot about um, Erna's uh, family history. You know, she was Jewish from from Vienna and um, her family were persecuted and, and killed by the, the Nazis and actually that's how she ended up in in the UK um, you know she was she was studying for an English degree and was doing her research project for it and uh, uh, but then obviously that happened and she couldn't couldn't get back home and uh, had to find a way to make a living and so that's how why she set up her um, her ski holidays and you know when she was um, <clears throat> Over here, she, you know, met many of that same sort of circle of people, the people who had been forced to leave, and you know, uh, Walter Ingham was was another one who'd have been uh, in very similar circumstances, and um, you know, obviously, 
you know, he'd been doing it for, for a similar sort of time as well. So she probably was inspired by what he'd been doing um, when she set up her, her um, initial ski holidays. So, right, but wasn't she doing it initially to try and kind of fund um, a trip to go back to visit her relatives? She was in the UK and she needed to kind of work out a way to uh, to get back to Austria. Yeah, so she was, um, you know, this was in, you know, the early 30s. So we, we hadn't sort of got to the, you know, the worst part of... Um, the, you know, the Nazis' excesses at that point. So um, she still still had her family there. So she was trying trying to get back to see those um, who were around. But um, you know, at that point, we hadn't seen you know Kristallnacht and and uh, yes. um, and all of those you know horrible events of, of the Second World War. So yes, yeah, she was uh, she was um, going back to to see her family. But you know. Uh, but then by the time the war came around, I mean, she was actually you know, not able to, to go back and she, um, you know, lost her, her citizenship and yeah. uh, became a British citizen. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned the war, see a fundamental factor in Erna Lowe's uh, life, not just with her, you know, becoming a, a resident of the UK, but something else I hadn't really understood until I read the book was about that pent up demand after the war because people hadn't been able to to travel at all over that period and there were young people really keen to kind of to see the world and that helped her um you know build up her travel business in the in the kind of you know later 40s and going into the 50s yeah um there were you know currency restrictions and um you know as you say people had grown up you know they'd, they'd have been at war for six years and um you know those young people had perhaps never had the opportunity to to explore beyond the shores of the uk um so you know there certainly was that demand and then as we sort of moved on obviously we come into the period of mass package tourism with the the advent of um, charter flights and you know that that was really that that whole sort of boom period for for skiing and and other sorts of, of package holidays and yeah we and it went from being a you know a very sort of niche activity for very rich people to be mm-hmm. something that that um, anybody could do and she she was in the right place at the right time to sort of tap into that demand and yeah. you know that's how we got to that point where we where we had you know more than you know, a million people in the UK who are active skiers, which, you know, I still find incredible, um, you know, given that, you know, obviously we have some uh, mountains in Scotland, at least for the, for the time being um, in the UK. But, um, um, you know, so, you know, it's a very ski loving nation, um, the UK. And, um, you know, that that was really what sort of uh, hit that spark i think you know yeah. that that sort of desire and, to see well, all these Ern- amazing... Lowe clearly you know played her her part in that in in uh, you know building up uh, interest and building up demand in the, in the uk for skiing you know it's uh, as a as an insight into the history of the ski industry as well as her life it's a it's an excellent read so uh, thanks uh, thanks again mark for all of your time in all of these interviews and uh, yeah i recommend anyone to to have a look at the book Thank you. That initial interview with Mark was held back in March of 2020. And I was lucky enough this summer to catch up with Joanna Yellowlease Bound, who commissioned the book, who was the CEO of Earn Low at the time, and to get her perspective on Aiming High, the biography of Earn Low. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined today by Joanna Yellowlease Bound. Uh, And the reason I wanted to get you on today is because I recently spoke to uh, Mark Frary, author of Aiming High, which we chose for our ski book group for the ski podcast. And Joanna, as uh, CEO of Ernalo Holidays uh, from, what, I think 1990, no, from 2002, was it, until last year? 1996 until last year. 1996 until last year. Uh, you knew um, Erna exceptionally well, didn't you? Because I believe that you first started working for the company or you first met her in 1982, is that right? Yep, that's correct. Um, I mean, the company was founded in 1932. And uh, yeah. yeah, I joined her in 1982. It's, I only realised when you asked me this question, you know, that is actually 50 years. So I joined her on her 50th kind of anniversary mm. of the company. So she'd already been going 50 years. Um, so I joined her in 1982, pretty well straight from university and uh, worked under her for right through until 1996. And then 
Um, she she retired, but what shall I say she wasn't a retiring person. She went home to watch Wimbledon, probably about age close to 90 at that point, or 85 anyway. Um, yeah, she'd have been 80, 85. She went home to watch Wimbledon and then just decided that she didn't want to come back. And that was that we then made the arrangement that I would take over the company fully. And I and that's from when I started 96 until last June, June 2020, when I sold it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, when, it, you know, that comes across in when I spoke to Mark about it, she clearly wasn't, uh, a, you know, she was a, wasn't a retiring person. She was a very outgoing person. But if yeah. I recall correctly, looking at the book, which I happen to have in front of me, which is, uh, you know, my, my secret advantage at the moment, she actually interviewed you in 1982 and offered you a job on the spot to send you straight out to La Plan. Is that right? Yes, she did. She, I, I, I was pretty green, straight from university, and I just wanted to kind of travel, work for a travel company, maybe. Um, I did languages. That was kind of... I didn't really have much clue what I was doing. I turned up in her little office, a little muse office in South Kensington. And um, we had a, we, she interviewed me quite firmly and her dog interviewed me too, backed me up against the wall. And um, <laughs> she used to have uh, poodles and dachshunds all her life and they would all accompany her to the office. And um, so she interviewed me there and then. And by the end of the interview, she said, right, well, you can have the job if you go to La Plania tomorrow with, <laughs> now I remember his name, it was a squadron leader, Roy Wayne. And right. I had to accompany squadron leader Roy Wayne because they were going to be doing the um, uh, 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 forces races in La Plan the year. Well, she was hoping to get the bid for it. So she sent me out there with him, hoping I would encourage him to book his big group for the following year. Now, I'd never been to La Plan before and um, it, it, I was completely green. Um, but squadron leader Wayne was a tremendous man. He was, and we worked together on the spot, figuring out what he needed. And by the end of the trip, he booked for the following year for 300 people. And so that was how I started was literally in the interview. Oh, but there was a problem when she told me, when she offered me the job, my passport was up in Cheshire, uh, where I came from. And the train was going at 9am the following morning. So <laughs> my mother had to set the passport down um, on the train overnight, which is what you did in those days. And I um, collected it at the station and just raced off with the squadron leader. And um, that, that, that's good, brilliant. You know, start. based on based on the uh, book, you know, it sounds so indicative of the type of person that uh, that Erna Lowe uh, was. You know, very dynamic, not one to kind of sit on her laurels, would never mess around, would just get on with things. And um, you quickly kind of became sort of. Well, I don't know if you were her personal assistant, but her second in command fairly quickly. Is that correct? Um, yes, that is correct. I mean, um, when I joined her, she just sold her company for a second time. So um, it, it's quite a fascinating history, as you'll see if you read the book. And Mark um, describes that incredibly well, how there were two buyouts. And when I joined her, she was supposedly retiring because she was at least 70 by that point. And um, so that we were it was very small. There was her, there was her secretary bobby who was a wonderful lady who'd worked for her yep. for like 30 years there was myself who was employed to do the sales for la plan um and then an au pair and one uh, and a bookkeeper so it was very small and um then slowly we well quite fast actually we kind of grew it back up again um it's it's and uh, so yeah and i i ended up uh working really kind of at the start it was great because i could do everything and she involved me in everything um um, and so I learned an awful lot from her and she, she had, she'd been in the industry obviously for so many years and she knew so many people that she would take me to APTA conferences with her. It was like training on the job. It was fantastic. I was a very, very lucky girl. Yeah. For sure. Uh, you know, one thing that struck me during the book was that, um, I guess there's a reason when someone stays in business for so long that actually, um, she was very commercially astute and spotted opportunities. And you spoke about the time when you joined, you know, you went out to La Plan. But she recognised quite early on that France, pr previously, historically, it comes across again in the book that uh, skiers, British skiers had historically always gone to Austria and Switzerland. But she saw that opportunity in France. And uh, I think Ernelo started representing La Plan and Flynn uh, in the UK. And that was part yes. of the, the, the kind of rise. She really spotted that France was going to be, the you know, was in the years to come, was going to be the leader for the ski market, really. And um, so she... Um, uh, 
um, had spent yeah many years doing doing Austria and Switzerland largely because that was her background, of course, um, coming from Austria. And um, but she she spotted straight away that France was was really up and coming. And whenever a new resort opened, because they were opening in the sixties and seventies, she would always be there first, having a look. That was yeah. her was was to always go and squirrel out new destinations. And her brochures, if you get a chance to look at her brochures, just are extraordinary. They had so many destinations in there. Uh, and she would always personally go and inspect them, as she said. Um, hmm. But she did spot very early on that France was going to be a very big thing. Um, and she spotted the opportunity for being a representative of ski resorts in the UK, which at that time was um, perfect for them because it, they needed to have the extra visibility. So working alongside Erna Lowe, as, as her as representative La Plan and then Flen and then Les Arc, um, um, it was a fantastic partnership. Yeah. And so you um, obviously, you know, Erna uh, died, you, you took over uh, the company. And how did it come about that you, you know, because you, you commissioned Mark to write the uh, book? How, how did you choose Mark? And, and how did that idea for getting uh, the book done come about? Well, um, it's really interesting because the thing about working for Erna, I've worked for her all, and I, I've worked for her all my working life. So when she died, I was already sort of, uh, what was I? I must have been, um, I was in my forties, and um, I had children, and um, I was very much uh, um, uh, seeing her as. Um, as, as a responsibility, I can almost see her looking over my shoulder now as I speak, if, if I can say that, in that yeah. um, she, she, she was extraordinary at um, keeping records of everything she did. So um, when she died, she left me all her archive, as I, I like to call it, and it's, it's still sitting in our, in our meeting room in Reese Mews in London, and it's a fabulous archive, but it's, it was, it can, I was kind of overcome by it because there was so much there so many interesting snippets and photos and press articles and uh, all sorts of things, letters from clients, uh, poetry that people had written about their trips on chalet holidays and so on. Mm. And there's this massive archive. And um, I, we were coming up to the 80th anniversary of the company and I was desperately thinking what I could do to kind of put her on record. And um, um, I'd known Mark a bit already through the ski press um, sort of, uh, fellowship as I'd like to say and yeah. uh, massively respected the way he's, he's, he um, writes he's, he's a very clear academic writer who squirrels out facts and backs them up and uh, is you know makes them really interesting I had looked at looked at his other books and I just thought I'd try and see if I could get him to write it and uh, he was passionate straight away when you know because he, he he knew a bit about history and he saw this archive and I think it was like a treasure trove really um and um, so I think looking back at it, I was incredibly lucky. I mean, I did spot that he was special, in a, but, but, but not quite as brilliant as, as the way he actually wrote this book. He was very funny, actually, when I asked him to write it. He said to me that he'd do it as long as I was not salesy. <laughs> so I was not allowed to interfere. And he did the right thing there because, you know, obviously you're going to try to promote your company. It's a natural thing. Um, but really, this wasn't about that. This was putting her on record. But it was also reinforcing the brand. It was reinforcing her history. And um, the, there's so many travel companies out there that have fabulous stories. And, and sometimes, you know, actually most of the time they're not told. And Mark um, and um, uh, also Richard Hollidge worked together. Um, and that, that's what gave me the seed of thought, oh, um, uh, do a biography. Or I should say it was, it was really Mark, who is Mark's initiative 100%. But they they recognised the two of them that um, all these fabulous travel companies were, were basically uh, founded on pioneers who needed to be recorded. So they had um, uh, they gave me this idea to do this, and then Richard Hollidge did a tremendous thing, which was to find. I, I had also been left as well as all her archive. I'd been left all her films and her cines and her slideshows and so on. And Richard did some tremendous um, work on going through all these films and. Um, uh, uh, they're now online. If you, I, I should, uh, you know, and they are absolutely fabulous. They really show a pictorial view of the 20th century. So I felt not only was I lucky enough to have someone like Mark write a biography, but the um, teamwork of the two of them together, um, working so that Richard did the film. Um, I, I kind of felt at peace that I had hmm. worked for so many years, but that I had actually managed to 
make something of what she had left me of this archive. Um, and um, it, it's uh, probably one of my proudest moments of actually working. It's not about making money, really. It's actually recording what an extraordinary life she had. She touched so many lives. For sure. Well, you know, I think, um, you know, I would personally like to thank you for getting that commission to Mark and getting him to write the book because I really enjoyed it and uh, I think I've mentioned to you before that as an insight into the ski industry uh, and its development over the years it really is it works not just as a, a biography of the life of a person but as a document uh, that shows you how skiing for British people uh, in general has evolved uh, or did evolve uh, over the years so it's a lasting legacy to both her and the industry so thanks very much for uh, for sharing that and your thoughts uh with us joanna and um when this goes live i'll make sure that we drop in the show notes some of those videos as well that you mentioned Fantastic. because i've seen them Thank they're you. very good thanks very Great. much all right okay bye-bye then bye-bye thank you